Welcome to the special Gallian Foundation webinar celebrating the best of the very best in life sciences innovation over the past 50 years. I'm Kyle Ashwarna and I'm in the clinical domain at Accenture Life Sciences globally. On behalf of the Pre-Gallian Awards Committee, it is my pleasure to chair the last of the five webinars presenting our 30 nominees in preparation for a truly landmark event pre Gallian Golden Jubilee Award Ceremony on October 27th in New York. There, we'll announce the most innovative product brought forward by our industry over the past 50 years in five distinct categories. Pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, orphan and rare diseases, vaccines, and medical devices and technologies. All told, the Jubilee event represents the most comprehensive assessment of private sector progress in combating disease over the past 50 years. Our focus today is on rare diseases, rare orphan diseases. With 7,000 such diseases still waiting to be treated or for a cure, the recognition of the work done in this area is critical in assessing the state of the science and technology that bring forward treatments for those patients who desperately need them. Our discussion today will shed light on the challenges of the journey from bench to bedside that each of our seven nominated products have encountered. And in their own unique and ultimately successful way, how they've impacted the lives of those patients who need them. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce a panel today. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Bennett, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of IONIS, and Dr. Priya Singhal, who is the Interim Head of Research and Development and the Senior Vice President and Head of Global Safety and Regulatory Affairs at Biogen for Spinraza, which is used to treat spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, Dr. Kampan, if you don't mind, uh, excuse me, uh, if you could please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and Dr. Singh after that. Dr. Bennett. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Frank Bennett. I'm Chief Scientific Officer for Ionis Pharmaceuticals, and I was involved in the early development, uh, discovery and development of uh, Spinraza. I, uh, the, the company that I work for is called uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, which is a, a biotech company focused on RNA targeting uh, therapeutics, and Spinraza is a, a great example of the success of the technology. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Dr. Singhal? Hi there. I'm Dr. Singhal, Priya Singhal, and I'm the interim head of R&D at Biogen. And I had the pleasure of joining Biogen back in 2012 when we had just licensed in Spindraza, and it was called New Sinersen then from Ionis. And we worked together with Frank and Ionis and Biogen teams to bring this therapy to patients. Thank you, Dr. Sangha. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Amy Buchbinder, YTB323 Global Program Head for Cell and Gene Therapy of Novartis, for Kimria, a gene therapy for blood cancers. Dr. Buchbinder? Yes, thank you. So I'm Abby Buchbinder, and I'm the Global Program Head for YTB323, which is the next generation uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, CAR T. Uh, that we're developing for various diseases, uh, which are CD19. I'm uh, very privileged to also have been involved with the development of Kimraya, which is going to be the drug that we're going to be speaking today and its role in the therapy of uh, patients, really children, with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Thank you, Dr. Swarma. Thank you, Dr. Finder. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gregory Freiberg, is the Vice President of Medical Affairs, LMAC Region for Amgen, or NPLATE, for Immune Thrombocytopenic Purpura Autoimmune Disorder. Dr. Thanks, Freiberg? Dr. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Swarna. My name is Greg Freiberg. I'm a medical oncologist by background. I've had the luxury of uh, being at my institution for uh, about 16 and a half years now and working in a variety of teams, variety of uh, ways to really bring these sorts of therapies closer to patients. So looking forward to talk today about uh, remiplistim which uh, is a, a mouthful, but it's N-plate is the, the brand name. And again, it's for idiopathic uh, thrombocytopenic uh, purpura. And we'll, we'll go into the, what that is and, and the details about it later. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Freiberg. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Campana, and apologies for the error earlier on, uh, who is the Executive Medical Director of Clinical Science at Takeda Oncology, representing at Cetris for adults with Hodgkin lymphoma. 
Uh, hello, thank you for the introduction. I'm, I do apologize, I have some hearing problems. And I am Frank Campana, I'm a medical oncologist by background, and I am executive medical director with Takeda, and I'm privileged to be the global clinical lead for Atsetris, one of the campaigns that we'll be discussing today. I have more than 16 years of experience in pharma industry, and I work it in several fields. Uh, my last field was a multiple myeloma, where I got approved on one drug, and now I have been working with uh, this uh, awesome drug, uh, Atsetris. Thank you, Dr. Campana. And I'd like to introduce Professor Graziella Pellegrini, R&D Director and Co-Founder of Holostem Therapy in Avadzate for Holocar, which is used in patients with corneal eye injury and disease. Dr. Pellegrini. Hi, good morning to everybody. I'm Graziella Pellegrini, I'm Professor at the Center for Generative Medicine of the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. And I was, uh, I'm also R&D director and founding member of Holostem Therapy Avanzate, who was born in 2008 to distribute and study the anti-advanced therapy medicinal product development by cell and gene therapy. We are treated by regenerative medicine, so by this uh, Oloclar, uh, hundreds of patients for the restoration of the ocular surface by human cornea rebuilt in vitro. Thank you, Dr. Peregrini. We have two additional products. Uh, unfortunately, we could not have representatives from those companies today for scheduling reasons. Um, the other two products that are on the list of nominees today are Yaskarta for cancer gene therapy and Kelideco for treating cystic fibrosis with a, with a specific gene mutation. Uh, Yaskarta from Gilead and Kelideco from Vertex. What we'll do now is really get into the heart of the discussion, and we've allocated enough time for questions from our viewers as well. Uh, please do submit your questions during, uh, there'll, be, there'll be time for you to submit questions through the Zoom Q&A button, and there'll also be an audience poll towards the end of the webinar, where we will try and understand what you think about the products that we've nominated today. As part of this discussion, what we'd really like to do is to cover two sort of central themes. How has the private sector, how has the private sector really responded to the substantial unmet medical need for patients who are confronting rare and orphan diseases? Like I said before, there are over 7,000 rare diseases. And it takes a lot of courage for our industry to really get into it and try and understand the unmet medical need and go through the often very arduous process of bringing these products that you've heard about today. That makes a very real difference for the patients who suffer and their families who suffer from these diseases. So we'll spend some time really trying to understand what it takes to bring these medicines to market. And secondly, what, sort of, what can the industry now sort of offer patients in terms of new pharmaceutical or diagnostic and interventions that are really changing the way in which these diseases are treated, uh, looked at now? We used to look at these as incurable afflictions, life-limiting, quality of life deteriorating, but we really have changed it. We brought hope to patients in ways that perhaps we were, it was not possible a, few, a, a decade or so ago. That's sort of the theme of our discussion today. And really moving into our discussion, what I'd like to do is to go around the panel and encourage a lively discussion amongst the panel members. My role is to try and stay out of it as much as I can, is to really ask the set couple of questions. Why did your company really choose to focus on this disease state? and the indication that's associated with this disease state, with this particular product. What are the level of unmet medical need and what prompted you, what are the signs that prompted you to go after this unmet medical need? And what has the journey been like in terms of bringing this product to market and impacting the lives of patients? Perhaps I can start with Dr. Bennett and Dr. Single uh, with their products. Yeah, so what I'd like to do is maybe start at the beginning and, and <clears throat> Um, identify that uh, why Ionis was interested in uh, developing a therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. So just to set the stage, spinal muscular atrophy is a severe neuromuscular disease that primarily that occurs in pediatric patients. So uh, what essentially happens is the nerves that connect to the skeletal muscle die and uh, you end up becoming very weak because you're not uh, getting innervation of the, the skeletal muscle. And uh, in the most severe form, the patients essentially become paralyzed and they're no longer able to breathe on their own. 
and usually succumb by the uh, to their disease by one year of age. So it's a very severe, life-threatening disease. And uh, due to some great science that was done, uh, uh, we uh, the scientists identified the mechanism by which the disease is occurring and identified this due to a loss of a gene called uh, a survival of a motor neuron. And it turns out that humans have a second copy of that gene that's defective. It still produces some uh, little bit of uh, functional protein, uh, but it's um, uh, not completely 100% uh, what it should be. And so we had a unique technology called antisense oligonucleotides that allowed us to uh, approach that second gene uh, at a molecular level so that we can uh, cause it to function normally. And uh, I, uh, I realize we have a very broad and diverse audience, so I won't get into the molecular details of that. Uh, but uh, bottom line is that we had a technology that we felt that uh, we could help these patients. And so we started a drug discovery program and ultimately uh, that was successful and uh, moved it into clinical development. And that's when we uh, partnered with our partners at Biogen to help with the clinical development, ultimately the commercialization. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Priya so that she could discuss uh, you know, uh, the, the second stage of the process. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, I think you heard about how devastating the disease is, spinal muscular atrophy, where babies will often not live beyond 13 months of age and almost never saw their second birthday. So we at Biogen, we are driven by the high unmet need in neurological diseases and by the science. These are our two North Stars. And we see ourselves as pioneers. We know that a lot of times these diseases are very hard to develop drugs for but we really identify with trying to get on this journey and actually have drugs that can make a difference to patients. So when we licensed Nusinersen or Spinraza, as it's known today from Ionis, more than a decade ago, it was exactly the kind of disease and the science that excited us. And we felt that, yes, that's a, a problem we would like to solve and we would like to be on a journey with a partner like Ionis to solve. And then uh, lo and behold, Spinraza was approved on a very historic day, 23rd of December, 2016, where there were no treatments for SMA. And today, more than 13,000 patients have been treated with Spinraza for SMA. And today, what we see in the community is that actually pediatricians are not seeing these patients anymore because the babies have grown to be adolescents and are moving on to adult physicians. That was not something that was a future that could be imagined back in 2012. So it's been a very, very amazing journey. Of course, there were lots of trials and tribulations along the way. And one of them was really trying to run placebo controlled trials because with rare and often diseases, that is one of the difficulties where you have to run a placebo controlled trial, which means some patients in the trials will get drug and others won't. And that was a very difficult situation, but we worked with regulators. And if I have to just talk about a few key takeaways from my journey, personal journey, as well as Biogen's journey, I think we learned two things, that it takes a village. We had SMA patients, the community, Ionis with the science, us as drug developing, uh, with drug development capabilities and the scientific background. And we had to partner with regulators and then bring this therapy to the market. And we are not done. We are continuing to run more trials, trying to increase the benefit. And I think what I feel very proud about I know Frank would share this, that we opened up SMA as a disease where there would be more breakthrough innovations beyond Spinraza even. So I think we opened the door and showed that there was a way possible forward. Thank you. Thank you, Priya, and thank you, Frank. That is amazing. That's an amazing story for SMA patients. So next, perhaps we can go to um, Dr. Bigfinder about Kimria in terms of, again, a massive unmet need and the work that is done by your team and Novartis is just fantastic. Love to hear your story on Kimria as well. Of course, thank you. 
So um, the rare disease that we're talking about is uh, pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which was the first indication for which Kimria was developed. And uh, fortunately, it is a rare disease, but nonetheless, it is the most common cancer in children. And at the time at which the story begins, the drugs that were approved when patients had one time and then a second time their leukemia coming back, these were children where less than one children in four had any chance to responding to any treatment. And if they did respond, the vast majority of them stopped having a response within three months. So the disease that we had was a disease that unfortunately hit children and that really had terrible, terrible results. But the story is that of a mini miracle. So there was a one patient clinical report that was published in the New England Journal. A patient, an adult with chronic lymphoblastic leukemia where a new therapy a chimeric antigen receptor T cell was described to have remarkable results. Well, what is this mini miracle? Well, in that one patient, the lymphocytes of that patient, the T lymphocytes of that patient were removed from the body of that patient and underwent engineering whereby they could now be directed to kill their leukemia. So taking the immune system of the patient and redirecting it, forcing to kill the leukemia. One patient, Academic Center, University of Pennsylvania, and Novartis said there's something over there. And that's when discussions occurred between Novartis and the University of Pennsylvania. Very rapidly it became evident that this mini miracle really can be a miracle against many CD19, that's the target, against CD19, expressing cancers. And the University of Pennsylvania did some small trials. It became evident that if you wanted to bring this to hundreds or thousands of patients, an academic center was not enough. That's where Novartis took a very, very big chance saying this is where industry can help academia in order to make this drug, this mini miracle available to many children. And, and, and the truth is the outcome is, speaks for itself. It's yeah. no longer one patient in four that responds where the response lasts three months. We're now talking about 90% of children, 80% of children that respond. And when we take a look, 55% of the children continue to be alive at five years. So this is the reason why I use this word repeatedly, many miracle, children, big risks for the company, but at the same time, what a beautiful thing to be able to bring this new therapy to small children, including, by the way, many adults, if you wish, people who are 18 years old, 25 years old. So it's not only little children, but it's yeah. such a beautiful thing to have been part of this. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. That is, that's an amazing story. In fact, we'll actually come back to that towards the end of the discussion in terms of what was unique at each of your companies at Novartis and at Biogen and Ionis that allowed you allowed the organization to take this risk on behalf of patients and come to it. Hopefully we'll have some time to get back to that. But I think that's it because that's really a remarkable part of it because these are initially what seemed like insurmountable odds to be able to get past. And, you know, under your leadership, it really happened. So I'd love to hear more about that. Dr. Freiberg, in fact, in fact one of the things with um, Enplate, it's been around for some time in the sense it really addresses a, a very horrendous part of uh, what of, of a disease process that's very challenging. So from an ITP perspective, you could just give us a sense from what you saw at Amgen, what, uh, yeah. what sort of enabled you to get to get past this area. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure to be on this esteem, esteemed panel uh, for Hall of Fame drugs for horrible diseases. So thanks for this opportunity. Yeah, um, you know, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So we, idiopathic, we don't know what really causes it. Thrombocytopenic, your platelets go down. And purpura, the classic red dotted rash that you get when you present with this. It's a disease that's considered a rare disease. It's about six per 100,000 per year. So it's not common. But uh, what is common about it is it can affect people. You know, we don't really know why it pops up. There can be children, it can be adults. Uh, but when your platelets drop suddenly, 
um, that puts you in not only a, a significant, uh, you know, problematic place for bleeding and these rashes, but also for severe problems like bleeding into your brain, a stroke and death. And so this was a disease that we've known about for quite some time, but we had a limited tool set to be able to intervene. Um, Amgen, um, of course, has been around since uh, the 1980s um, and had a rich history in working in, um, in benign blood conditions in cytokines that help stimulate the bone marrow, the factory of your, of your blood products to make these different red cells and white cells. And so it was a natural um, scientific endeavor for the organization that had the tools to be looking at this sort of science to look at other bloodlines, including platelets. And that's what happened um, a little over 20 years ago. Um, it was a story, though, that wasn't quite as straightforward as some of the other uh, bloodlines when you're trying to bring forward forward a therapy. Um, as, uh, and, and again, we have to remember, we're back now, you know, 15, 20 years ago, where protein engineering was also, uh, you know, starting to come of age. And certainly we had antibody therapeutics, but this was a case where if you just made the peptide, the, the switch for what's called TPO, which is, think of it as the, uh, you know, the, the, the switch that, that, help, that tells your factory to make more platelets. The truth was just making that protein was not good enough. Your body would clear it, it wouldn't work well enough, and certainly an antibody wasn't the answer. So n plates an interesting story where for this disease, again, that can strike out of nowhere, it, uh, a tool was created that was actually a bit of a Franken molecule. We call it a peptibody. So it was a peptide antibody fusion. But, you know, this is sort of the molecular artistry, I think, that many of us, you know, had the luxury of working with some of these, these protein engineers that went into a molecule like this. And, you know, in that regard, um, you know, there were bumps along the road when this molecule was brought in for ITP. Just to take a step back, these are patients who um, sadly have to get high doses of steroids. They get huge infusions of immunoglobulins to try to, you know, stop this destruction of platelets. Because what's going on is your immune system, for whatever reason, has decided it's going to destroy your platelets. You know, a wildfire is burning them up. And so there's two ways that you can think of addressing that. You can try to quelch the fire, but that means turning your immune system off. And of course, that comes with all sorts of problems when you turn the immune system off. Or you can try to increase the production of platelets. So that's what end plate does. That's it, it tries to increase the production of platelets, whereas the prior therapies were trying to really turn off the immune system. So, you know, again, uh, it was uh, a, a program that went fairly rapidly. Uh, it's a rare disease, but, you know, in this case, it was obvious uh, from the very get-go that this was a, a very potent molecule. In fact, it was it was about ten times more potent than we than we had predicted from preclinical models. That's a whole other drug development story. Um, it's also, uh, I think, as I had alluded to, it's not the first of the molecules that we tried. I think it was the third or the fourth generation. And so, you know, again, medicine is an iterative process. Drug development is an iterative process. But this is a great example where for a disease that previously was treated with the hammers that try to knock uh, the immune system down, splenectomies to remove, you know, the organ that sequesters uh, platelets in many cases. Now that there's this new tool, um, it's been on the market for about 15 years. About 150,000 patients have been able to use this. And as with many other others, I think we'll get into this. It's also a program that has progressed. It started with the sickest of patients. It's moved up into uh, newly diagnosed patients, pediatric home administration kits. But again, trying to make this uh, a therapy that can help patients with what otherwise could be a devastating disease that can strike at really any time in your life and let those patients not live in fear, but live a normal life. And of course, uh, let them be productive members of society. Uh, so thank you again for letting me do, give the introduction. Looking forward to the, the conversation. Thanks, Greg. Really appreciate it. I, again, the same, same underlying theme. I mean, it took a lot of courage for you and your team and Amgen to bring and play to market, and given sort of the challenges that you face in the patient population. Like, we'll explore that in a little more detail as we get into it. But um, Dr. Campana at Cetris and sort of to get oncology, I mean, pretty amazing in terms of what you've been able to do with at Cetris. Love to hear the story. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. So at Cetris has been uh, approved for almost 10 years already. And this, uh, you know, like was mentioned before uh, by Dr. Freiberg is an engineered protein where a monoclonal antibody was covered with a molecule of, of chemotherapy to attack specifically the CD30 cells that are widely present in Hodgkin lymphoma. 
So and since 2009, Sijin and Takeda have been part of a mutual collaboration to globally develop and commercialize at Cetris. And under this collaboration, you know, Sijin has the rights of um, developing and commercialize uh, at Cetris in the US and Canada, and Takeda has the rights uh, to do it uh, worldwide. So researchers and clinicians began decades ago developing this life-changing molecule that would ultimate, ultimately become available first to relapsed and refractory Hodgkin lymphoma patients in 2011, following the FDA approval. And while this compound was originally developed by our partner, CGEN, then Takeda has worked to bring the drug to the lives of more than 60,000 patients in more than 70 countries around the world. So um, Hodgkin lymphoma represents around 0.5 of all the new cancers diagnosed in the US. And it, for patients uh, that were not treated before for this disease, the standard treatment is a combination of several agents of chemotherapy. And despite this fact that these patients can respond some of these patients, around 25 to 40% of these patients would relapse. And you know, there are no, there, there are needs to treat these patients after um, they relapse. So uh, at Cetris was initially explored in patients who had a relapsed or refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, and that led to our one of our first approvals. And uh, currently we have several indications approved for uh, at Cetris and not only Hodgkin lymphoma. So we have uh, uh, approved Hodgkin, uh, at Cetris being approved in CD30 positive Hodgkin lymphoma at increased re risk of relapse um, after autologous stem cell transplantation uh, is approved as well in previously untreated CD30 positive stage four Hodgkin lymphoma in combination with adriamycin, vinblastin, and dacarbacin, which is a common combination uh, in frontline therapy for these patients. It's approved as well for relapsed and refractory CD30 positive Hodgkin lymphoma following autologous stem cell transplantation or following at least two prior uh, lines of therapy. Then it's not only approved for Hodgkin lymphoma, it's approved as well for other rare uh, types of uh, lymphoma, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. For example, it's approved for uh, previously untreated systemic anaplastic stem, uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma in combination with cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, and prednisone. It's approved as well for uh, relapsed or refractory systemic ALCL and for the treatment of adult patients with a CD30 positive cutaneous T cell lymphoma after at least one prior systemic therapy. So where we started was one of the first phase three trials that was evaluated was the ESEA trial that started in 2012, immediately after the original approval in the US. And this study evaluated uh, at Cetris in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma who are at risk of relapse due to residual disease following autologous stem cell transplant. And this trial was the first completed randomized trial that explored the consolidation treatment uh, immediately after following uh, autologous stem, um, stem cell transplantation as a way of extending the effect of transplant and preventing relapse among high-risk patients with Hodgkin lymphoma. After this initial data from this trial were announced, the scientific community was incredibly encouraged by this success. And that led to the next trial, um, phase three trial, which the phase, uh, who is the phase three echelon one trial, which is a randomized two arm multicenter study comparing the use of Alcetris and AVD to ABVD, which is a standard treatment as a frontline in more than 1,300 patients with previously untreated stage three and four classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And the study met the primary endpoint that was modified progression-free survival and received approval for this indication in March of 2018 in the US and in February 2019 in the EU. And yeah. recent analysis for, from this trial um, particularly the key secondary endpoint overall survival 
demonstrated the statistically significant improvements, improvement in overall survival in patients treated with acetrus in combination with AVD. <clears throat> and this echelon one study is the first trial to show a, st a statistically significant improvement in overall survival for patients with advanced Hodgkin lymphoma in over two decades. So uh, over two decades. And Takeda is extremely proud of the results of the Echelon 1 trial, as these findings represent transformative improvement um, in care that may uh, profoundly impact the lives of patients with advanced disease. Thank you, Frank. Again, that, that, that is, again, the fact that we sort of established a beachhead and then looked after so many other patients with so many other potential indications is very remarkable. Um, last but not least, I'd like to, you know, talk about Holocar uh, with Professor Pellegrini and what, a, what an extraordinary area to look into because we're talking about vision loss. We're talking about permanent vision loss, a situation where patients have no other choices. And really what you and Holistan have done is change the way in which corneal injury is being treated. Love to hear more about your journey with respect to that drug and how patients benefit from it. Yeah. So, uh, well, my company was, uh, uh, I mean, was just founded to start the registration and the distribution of this human tissue engineered cornea to treat blind patients. But I mean, to show which kind of rare diseases, which kind of pathology, I would like to show you uh, briefly a movie uh, to understand in a, in a short time what is the pathology, which is not obvious. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So if, if we look at the ocular surface of patient, we can distinguish the transparent part of the eye, which is, which is colored from appearance because of the iris below from the conjunctiva. And in the middle between them, like a ring around the, the cornea, there is a thin area called limbus where we have the stem cell. Those um, uh, violet cells, they usually repair and renew the cornea over time and maintain the stable physiology. In case of partial damage due to accident that can occur to children or to adult people, the, those stem cells can repair the damage. But in case of an extensive damage that can be for uh, house accident or uh, work accident, if the limbus is destroyed, the only area that can repair the ocular surface is the conjunctiva, which is white and driving vessels, making the patient blind. So those patients before this, uh, this invention, this new treatment, were uh, basically repeatedly treated by corneal transplant with the worsening of their condition. Then uh, later on, uh, we rebuild, start to rebuilding the uh, human ocular surface by stem cell taken from the same patient. This is an important part of the work that we develop as uh, uh, this uh, is something that uh, requires a uh, small removal of tissue from the original patient. It's uh, small like a mosquito in the eye, so very small. And from this small area, we can extract the stem cell of the same patient to rebuild the entire cornea, which is eventually transplanted after removal of this conjunctiva grown, grown, over, the, grown over the cornea. This is something that changed completely the life of the patient as they have immediate disappearance of symptoms as a strong pain. You can imagine, I mean, by touching the ocular surface, which is provoking discomfort, how is a burn of the ocular surface? And they stop having pain, burning, photophobia. They recover the visual acuity and the physiologic appearance of the eye, which is important also for social interaction of the patient. And they can drive, work, be autonomous, independent in the society. They do not require repeated drug administration, no medical evaluation, no problem in social interaction at work in the day-by-day -day life. They can also save money for home adaptation because of course blind patients need several uh, change in their day-by-day -day life. The clinician like this treatment as it reduces the risk of damage of residual part of the ocular surface and the tissue engineering require a very small biopsy and do not 
uh, induce any immunologic reaction because it's built with the same cells of the patient. I want just to uh, uh, add one, just one, uh, one image to show because this can uh, highlight how, what is the meaning of that, which is this one. You can, you can see here the sure. results on the ocular surface of a patient. They come back as they were before. And they, they have an, this treatment has an impressive stability over time as we have measured up to 10 years stability uh, for the patient. The percentage of results is close to 80%, despite the complexity of the treatment, which is, of course, requires several passages. So this is for uh, basically uh, adult and the child. Of course, the were, we had an impressive challenge from a scientific regulatory, especially regulatory, because is in Europe, the regulatory issues in the field are, are a lot because uh, the re regulatory system is quite new. And from an organizational point of view, we were able to achieve the results because of a public-private partnership, which was critical for sharing resources, sharing cost, and uh, sharing uh, research, which is always requested in this kind of reconstruction of a human organ. I don't want to, to take your time uh, for long. So I want to conclude only that this was not only a results with a social implication, economic implication, in addition to, of course, uh, patient uh, well-being, but also was important because this formed a platform, a new platform where we knew, uh, we learned a lot of things that was, uh, I mean, then develop in different direction and have given now uh, the possibility of developing other clinical trials with other epithelia and gene therapy treatment just because what we learn in this passage, this long path was very helpful for additional treatment, was a real platform that can be used for several rare diseases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pellegrini. And I'd be remiss if I did not mention again, Yaskarta and Caladeco. Uh, it's really changed the lives of cancer patients and cystic fibrosis patients. And we'll hear more about that during the actual award ceremony on the 27th. I'd like to sort of pick up where Dr. Pellegrini left off in terms of what is special? What was special about these indications, about the environment at each of your companies? Because from my perspective, in the last decade or so, if you see what has happened in immuno-oncology, or if you've seen what happened in cell and gene therapy, or in stem cells, or really across the board, it's, there's a renaissance in science that is hard to describe. It's an exciting time to be in science. But it takes a great deal of perseverance and a great deal of courage and sort of backbone to push these drugs through a complex organization. We see this every day. So I'd like to start with the point you made, Dr. Pellegrini, in terms of sort of the regulatory challenges you faced in terms of getting Holocar across the finish line and being able to design the trials, especially pediatric trials and the like, and sort of you described the difficulties. Perhaps you can sort of you know, start the conversation off and then we can go around the table and feel free to jump in, uh, panel, uh, as, as you see fit in terms of if something resonates with you. I'm just gonna step back and Dr. Pellegrini, why don't you kick us off? Sorry. So, I mean, uh, yeah, of course, this kind of, uh, this kind of approach, at least for advanced therapy medicinal product, uh, from a regulatory point of view, uh, is impressive because uh, the field of uh, advanced therapy medicinal product in Europe is new and was defined as a drug. I mean, this kind of product were defined as drug quite recently. So this means that uh, the regulation was the, the regulation of uh, standard pharma, pharmacological product that was applied to something which is living, continuously transforming as it is in human tissue. So this makes everything difficult. In addition, 
I mean, the kind of cost of this kind of, of this product is completely different as uh, we cannot test one sample for a big batch. We have to test each single batch because each batch belongs to a specific patient has his own characteristics. So this make the organization, the logistic and the, and the, the, the company uh, work uh, workflow more difficult and was, I mean, quite a big effort. I think that the impact on the society was clearly proven as we have, uh, we have shown that despite these difficulties, we were able to distribute this kind of product all over, all over Europe, in different countries, uh, organizing everything and, uh, I mean, setting some sort of training of surgeon and providing to the patient, to the workers, because most of those patients are uh, workers or children having accident at home or people like that. So it is possible to do this kind of work and there's a huge impact on the society. This makes the family changing their life because having a, a person which is uh, uh, unable to manage it himself or herself in the life change the life of the whole family, in addition to the cost for the society, because they cannot work, they cannot drive, they have a lot of problems. So I think that the impact on the society is, is clear. Uh, this is not life-saving, but as I told, this is for the well-being, for the social activity for the day-by-day -day, um, living of the society, of the economic, uh, with economic impact. But this kind of platform was useful for the development of other treatments which were uh, life-saving. So, and started from the previous knowledge on treatment of burns as a life-saving treatment. So th there is a connection in the experience developed by this. But I see many hands, so I don't know if there is somebody that wants to ask something or tell something. Okay. Um, you know, maybe we go from here to, uh, to Frank and to Priya, because if you think about what happened in the context of Spinraza, I think Priya, you said something that was very, very poignant, which is how do you conduct a placebo control study in a pediatric population with something like SMA? And what are some of the challenges that Ionis and Biogen faced at that time? And what did you have to do? And perhaps after that, uh, AB, if you could talk about the same sort of condition from a CAR-T perspective, where it is highly individualized. You know, th these are unique challenges, but many of them seem to have a lot of commonality. And what I'd like to explore with the panel is you know, what would what did you have to do? What did your teams have to do personally in terms of having to advance this thinking within your organization? And what were some of the challenges there? Um, Frank and Priya? Yeah. So <clears throat> maybe I can I, I start off at the beginning because I was more involved with the beginning of the project. And, uh, you know, we had a new technology that had never been given to uh, children before. Uh, we, we had a new disease where really there hadn't been any clinical trials that had been conducted in, in this disease. So there were a lot of navigations that uh, we had to go through to uh, a lot of paths we had to navigate to be uh, ultimately to bring the drug to, to patients. And we felt it was because it was in a vulnerable pediatric uh, patient population, we had to create a very strong foundation showing that the drug number one uh, was effective and in, in doing what it, you know, what it was designed to do, but also safe. And uh, with that in hand, then we started engaging re regulatory agencies and uh, they were, uh, you know, rightfully a little bit skeptical, but uh, they didn't create roadblocks. They, they wanted to, to see the drug come forward. And they, they were very um, uh, collaborative in, in, in the beginning, uh, as far as uh, bringing the, the, the drug to patients. And I'll let Priya talk about sort of the, the struggles that we had to do uh, placebo uh, controlled trials. I mean, for me personally, it was a, a very hard struggle and we had to deal with a lot of patients and advocates, you know, patient advocates, um, in, you know, in that process. Uh, uh, yeah. Priya, you... Thank you, Frank. And thank you for that excellent question. You know, I, before we kind of discuss it, I, I just wanted to draw that mental picture with patients and children who were born with spinal muscular atrophy. You had babies who were not making it past their 13th month uh, of life. 
And really with type one SMA, which was our primary, you know, where we started, uh, babies did not survive beyond two years. And they were often for most of that life duration, they were on ventilation and had so many other issues. So from our perspective, you know, when, as I said, we had two drivers, I think uh, the science that we, we felt was at a tipping point. So I think you have many opportunities, you have many, and there's opportunity costs. So where do you invest your resources? I think for us, it has to be a very high unmet need. We see ourselves as pioneers. Part of that is that, you know, you have to have the courage to fail. So there, this was definitely not a given or a certainty by any means. And I think it was the resilience, combination of resilience and courage that helped us take that step. But then the data that Iona shared with us from a scientific perspective, we believed that the science was at a tipping point. And as mm. Frank mentioned, this was a very interesting way in which we were going to deliver the drug. It was going to be delivered via the spine, via a, spine, a lumbar puncture. And when we initiated the dis discussions with regulators, they said, well, you have to do the two uh, control trials, right? So we were even ready to do the two control trials. And I think we had come to terms with that, that it will be placebo controlled. But then we had to do a sham control, which means babies who weren't getting the drug would still have this sham yeah. control so that there would be no bias. The, these were complicated challenges. Then I want to kind of shift your attention to two more aspects. One is because, as Frank said, there were no clinical trials. There was really no data. There was no natural history, there very little natural history data, and there were no endpoints. So we had to derive an endpoint that could actually unequivocally demonstrate that the drug either had effect or didn't have effect. Yeah. And we did that collectively, which was another very big milestone. And finally, we had to convince neurologists and scientific community, you know, to do these trials, because remember, these were babies that there was really no option they could give to parents when parents brought the babies in. So we had to create that infrastructure. And so I think that was just a few of the challenges, but it was worth everything because we now have, I recently got information of a baby who was part of our pivotal trial who just celebrated uh, an eighth birthday. Wow. So what a milestone that is. Indeed. Indeed. Thanks again, Priya and Frank. And Abby, I mean, picking up from there in terms of, you know, you mentioned yep. this true mini miracle, the magic that yes. happened and the collaboration between Novartis and UPenn. That, that's sort of an incredible story. And we see this quite often in our industry. And I'd love to sort of pick it up there in terms of- so, how did Absolutely, you absolutely. So, so again, I think that that one case report is what really piqued the interest of people. And it was great science and it was science fiction, right? I mean, it, it really was remarkable, but it was great science. And then entering into a dialogue between the industry and between University of Pennsylvania, seeing that they had already said, you know what, we are retargeting a natural part of the immune system, right? The, the T cells that know how to kill if only they were targeting the right target on the cancer, yeah? And then University of Pennsylvania already was already doing something in that direction, right? Four children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But what was the challenge? The challenge is over here, we have patients who have a disease and the drug doesn't exist until the patient first comes and knocks at the door, I need a drug. And the question is, how are you able to manufacture the drug to create that drug one patient at a time and be able to think beyond one academic center to think how is this going to be able to be done for children who have acute lymphoblastic leukemia anywhere in the world? And then thinking even bigger, what about, lympho what about lymphomas, right, in adults? What about adults with, with acute lymphoblastic leukemia? And the big challenge is to say, how is it going to be done? How can you create a promise that there is going to be this mini miracle and it's not going to be for only a few patients, that this is going to be something that can be done for a large number of patients? And I think that there is a science, but then there is courage and there is leadership. And it takes someone to say, you know, this is humongous amount of investment that's going to need to be done, but the science is there, the medical need is there, the rationale behind it is there. 
And we're going to have to find a way to first have a patient come in, say, I have a terrible cancer. And within a short period of time to be able to take their lymphocyte, transform the lymphocyte and create really a living drug. So you give a certain amount of cells and then those cells proliferate. One cell becomes two, becomes four. And now you have this living drug that is killing the cancer. And I think that it's this question of leadership and courage that is, of course, driven by science that's important. You know, given the fact that the available therapies for these children at that time were less than one patient in four had any response, and over half of the patient, that response did not last. Yeah, they, they, it didn't last more than three months. We were very fortunate when speaking to health authorities, speaking to medical experts, there was not the need for a randomized study for that first pivotal children, a trial in children, right? And the reason is because the, the, the results were so clear. In the, in, the, in the University of Pennsylvania study, 90% response compared to one in four. It was 80% in, in, in the Novartis multicenter study compared to one in four. Those responses lasted. Within three months, you knew what was going to happen. So it was really nice. And I just want to say that right now we're very happy. It's not only in children, it's also in adults. Uh, it also showed the way, I think, for many other companies to also create their own CAR T cells, also targeting CD19, which is great. We know that our drug, Kimraya, has now been manufactured over 7,800 times. What a, what a beauty compared to what any academic centers could do. So this is kind of the, the passion that existed. And that's really what was, um, what was really important in this partnership between academia and the industry. Yeah. Thank you again. I mean, again, what a, what a, what a sort of incredibly empowering story, because it is about those partnerships. Our industry is we're in it for the long game, right? We're not sort of in it for the sprint. It's a true marathon. I think what you've indicated here is sort of both the courage as well as the ability to see beyond what the initial potential problems are. Also, want to sort of call out the special role that our regulators, our regulator colleagues play in this. They they're really empowering us, enabling us as an industry to bring these miracle therapies, these incredible therapies to patients who need them. And I, I think they deserve a, a great deal of praise and a great deal of sort of gratitude from us and from the patients in terms of being able to do this. So, you know, with that, one of the other things, of course, is if you take a look at something like, like um, Endplate, I'd love to sort of understand um, in terms of sort of uh, from your perspective, Greg, you know, Amgen had often, you know, was in a place where you had incredible pioneered biotechnology and you worked in supportive care, you worked in areas of sort of really looking at oncology patients and kidney disease patients. Uh, how, what did it take to really look at a relatively small indication at that point in time in terms of ITP and make the investments, you know, convince the teams that needed to be convinced in terms of what needed to happen? Yeah, very fair question. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, I think there's two themes um, that we're, we're hearing already, but I, you know, I, I really resonate with me. One of those themes, um, and we've heard this actually from almost everybody here, is, is there first and foremost needs to be a, a some sort of biologic insight into the disease. And usually an organization will have its own infrastructure, its own focuses, but sometimes that will pull us in different directions. In the case of Amgen, being in supportive care, doing bone marrow, you know, working in the factory that makes the blood cells, um, you know, there was a logical biologic connection to the research teams that were doing this work. So, so there was a logical next step. There were insights in terms of the molecular biology of the disease, the switches that we could think about, um, uh, you know, working with. But the idea here was that we wanted to come up with a drug that increased the platelets. There are other diseases that that might be useful for, but ITP was one area in particular uh, that was the focus. The second key biologic insight before we get to the second pillar is that you, you need to also have uh, you know the biologic insights of the tools that you're using and you know we've heard some great examples of you know uh, you know eye stem cells and and you know uh, chimeric antigen receptor t cell therapies and you know we're, we're we, we've heard about one of the first antibody drug conjugates these these are the tool sets that we as an industry then can apply uh, and in the case of amgen doing peptide and protein engineering, that was really our sweet spot. And so making this Franken molecule, for lack of a better term, um, that, that tried to, um, you know, build upon what we knew that peptides and proteins could do, but elongated the half-life, avoided anti-drug antibodies, avoided agonist 
versus antagonist activity of certain receptors. That's complicated. This, you know, this isn't math. This is biology that we're working in. And, and this sort of deep biologic understanding is one of the, the underpinnings that I think ultimately draws us to these diseases. The second theme, a uh, big theme though here is the one of partnership. I think for a, a large organization to invest in a small indication, there are certain things that you know, we need to be thinking about broadly. How are we gonna help the most number of patients? How is that going to be a good investment for society. We've heard uh, you know, a lot about uh, partnerships with academia. I won't repeat them. We've heard about the regulators, but I will bring up the health technology assessment um, you know, side of things as well. And particularly what we've seen over you know, these past 20 years is there is a growing alignment between some of the health technology assessments and the regulators. That's a great direction, making sure that the, you know, arguably two of the customers for the data set, other than the patients, you know, to be able to ultimately unleash uh, the potential of these drugs to get to patients that they're aligned in terms of you know what what not only is a you know fileable an approvable endpoint but what will society value so in Europe for example you know there there are a variety of activities going on the joint clinical assessment program and so forth but this idea that not only is are we dealing with multiple uh, partners outside of our own institutions but we need to make sure that they're interacting with each other we all have you know a clear set of goals and I think again it's been nicely pointed out that the regulators have just been very flexible in working with sponsors, working, you know, again, with our academic colleagues to make sure that as we move along, that we're developing the data sets that society wants and will value. Thanks again, Greg. I mean, you know, I can't help but sort of, you know, marvel at the excitement in all our voices. We sort of all tend to geek out on this because our patients really drive us to do this. For those of us in the audience who perhaps uh, may not work in this industry or may not be involved with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I hope it's evident to you that you know, everyone on this call, I mean, it's, it's incredible to be with this panel, is, is driven by a mission that goes beyond uh, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. This truly is the long game. It takes decades often to take the basic signs, like we heard about the University of Pennsylvania story or the, the story from Ionis and Bison, all of them. It just takes, a, it's a long haul. And, you know, I just can't help but admire the fact that the tenacity that each each person on this call and their teams have as individuals, but also the companies have to make this happen on behalf of those patients. We have a long way to go. That I'd like to sort of, you know, uh, really bring Dr. Campana into the discussion, perhaps pivot the conversation in a different way. I mean, et cetera, you, you gave us an incredible story in terms of what happened with, the, with et cetera, in terms of, indication after indication, sort of the way in which you have to go about this methodically, build the evidence, go after one indication first, and then go, design a new trial, getting it to the next indication. Yeah. How can we scale that? How can we actually bring that to all these other diseases that are out there? Yeah, I mean, as we said, everything is based on science. And then, you know, once you get the science, you need to generate the evidence. And the evidence sometimes can little by little that you cannot have everything at the same time. So the first part you will generate is when you have these patients that did not respond to initial treatment, focus on these because these are the patients that really need a new kind of treatment. Once you have established that, you start thinking about how can I move these to benefit an even larger number of patients, like Dr. Butch Bitter said, you know, we cannot limit ourselves only to a small number of patients that have their disease that is coming back again. Let's try to benefit a larger number of patients. And that's why, you know, we try to move forward as early as possible to as possible to benefit a larger number of patients. And we ended up coming to patients that were never treated for their diseases and try to provide a better outcome for these patients. Because at the end, you know, our mission is to provide benefit to the patients. And these patients are the real heroes here because with no, if we don't have the patients to use these drugs, we cannot move forward in this industry. These are the real heroes here, the patients. Yeah. And again, thank you. You reminded us again that patients, the voice of the patient, especially in the rare disease community, patient advocacy groups and the family members and the community that surrounds the patient plays an incredible role and bringing attention to what is, in fact, a very difficult situation. I can't help but, even though, you know, Professor Pellegrini said that this was not a life-saving medicine, I, it sort of gives me goosebumps to think about the fact that somebody who was functionally blind can now function 
and drive and live life normally. And the impact that it has on that individual and their family members can't be understated. We have a few more minutes to sort of, you know, perhaps explore one other area before we get into some audience questions and get into a poll. Part of the challenge is, you know, given the fact that in rare diseases, the economics often don't work in, in the favor of the industry, and we have such a large range of rare diseases to pick from, where do you see a challenge in terms of the translation of academic science into, if you will, into the drug discovery pipelines of companies? And what can we collectively as an industry do in terms of encouraging those PhD students and postdocs to think about these areas that perhaps are not as as dynamic in their minds, but we really think think the long game. Because I do believe, you know, and Dr. Collins has said in the past, in terms of the fact that being able to bring academic science into the industry is something that is a potential challenge. We see some headwinds in that space. We'd love to get your thinking on that. Uh, Frank, do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah, it's something I've, I've been doing a lot of thought on is that you know, I don't think there's headwinds in bringing academic science into industry. I think the industry's uh, very receptive to, um, you know, considering academic science. And you heard a great story from Dr. Uh, Buckbinder, uh, an example of that. I think the challenge is really um, what size patient population will the industry take on? And, you know, we there are a lot of rare diseases that I think our technology and the industry could address but the economics don't support it. And to me, that's that's the big challenge is figuring out the healthcare system as a way to help compensate, you know, for the investments for doing a clinical trial for a patient population that may be 100 or 200 patients out there. Um, the return on the investment's not gonna happen. And, and so um, I think as a society, we, we really do need to uh, rethink how we're approaching some of this. And, and I'm, I'm being very philosophical and, and um, you know, recognize that it's, there, there are no easy answers to that question, but it's, it's one I struggle with personally, uh, you know, that uh, I think technology has developed where it could treat, you know, a lot of diseases that aren't being treated today. Uh, Indeed. Abby, do you want to sort of jump in in terms of sort of, again, I, you know, your experience with UPenn sure. is fantastic. I'd love to sort of... Sure, kind of sure, 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 sure. So I think that there is, you know, there is a creativity, right, that exists in, in, in academia that is kind of different than the activity that exists not in academia, right? And there is the ability to move at a certain pace. There are certain questions that can be asked. There are certain seeds that one can start sowing. Yeah. And this is very, very different from sometimes what is, is done in industry. Sometimes there's a great overlap. Yes. And I think that in part, the question of what may or may not be interesting to have a partnership with. The truth is there's a humongous diversity also in the industry. There are some companies that may say, you know what, if, if this is not going to help at least 100,000 patients, for example, it's going to be very difficult for me to knowing how much it takes to move. The other parts of the industry that may be very different, um, I'm thinking also, by the way, with certain other types of partnerships that exist. Um, I, again, just thinking about... Um, you know, about cancer, right? Or about lymphoma, since this is what I've been doing. There are certain societies, right? So, so certain lymphoma societies. There are, there, are, um, there are donators that are really important that have the ability sometimes to work for very small diseases where there's beautiful science and it works, but it may not have ability to move outside of an academic center unless this happens. And yeah, it is also very correct that there may be certain illnesses or certain new therapies that may struggle. But I think it's very important to continue to maintain the science, to continue to maintain um, this creativity. And one does not know where it may lead, right? So one is thinking about the first patient, again, for Kimra, the first patient with CTL-19, that happens to have been a, a, a CLL patient, right, that was treated. And yet we are over here talking about acute lymphoblastic leukemia, lymphomas. No, these are really very different diseases, yes? So I think that it may start one place and then move to some other direction. And historically, by the way, CAR-Ts and University of Pennsylvania and Carl Jung had been working on CAR-Ts for many other diseases where it didn't really work well. 
uh, HIV, for example, right? But the point is that the experience that was gained, and it was in academia, this is something that could not have taken place, I think, in industry, but yet, boy, did it help to arrive at where we are right now with many companies having products. And it happens to be that now the drug is used against leukemias or lymphomas. So I think that there is a need to continue. And, and yeah, I don't deny the fact that some areas are going to have struggles. Yeah. Again, thanks again, Abby. In fact, one of the questions from the audience that I'd like to sort of weave into the discussion is, you know, we talked about the fact that clinical science and clinical development ultimately is the only path we have to get our, our, our breakthroughs to patients. And yet we struggle with that. We struggle with the number of participants in clinical trials. We struggle with regions of the world where we either don't have the infrastructure or the ability to bring the right patient population into trials. There's been a lot of discussion around diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. But we, my team, we tend to think of it slightly differently, which is that it's about having the right diversity to demonstrate clinical evidence that's durable in a larger population downstream, as opposed to looking at it purely from a race or a gender or an ethnicity perspective. Priya, I'd like to sort of get your thoughts on how do you think we can expand access to clinical development uh, around the world? What, what, what do you think we as an industry could do better in terms of making sure that, one, we have more people participating in trials, and secondly, we can expand the reach of trials to patients the ideal dream of making clinical development part of the care continuum? How do we bring that into the into reality? It's a great question, Dr. Swarna. So maybe I can also just address the prior one because I, I put my hand up because I feel that so passionately about it. So I think it's really about the entire ecosystem. Industry, we, we specialize in drug development, academia, specializes in science, and there's a lot of overlap there. In addition, I think the stakeholders like regulators, folks who control access, patient advocacy, patients themselves who should be really at the center of all our efforts, I think without us paying attention to the entire ecosystem, we can't succeed. And I feel like today what I've seen in uh, and what's come shining through for me is that in all these examples, we focused on the patients. We focused on the unmet need and we went backwards from there. The science, everything was kind of came together. Uh, to address your question about diversity and such, I think that, you know, it's very important that we run our trials. We are able to run our trials, but I think that we need to modernize it. We need to go where patients are. We need to take the trials to them. And, and we recently did this in one of our natural history trials where it's completely remote. And we have another natural history trial in Alzheimer's also completely remote with a device. So the question here is how do we make the trials more accessible? And the flip side of it for me is that why do we believe that we need to collect it in the traditional way? Because the real world evidence and real world data, I think we've talked about it a lot. We've talked about collecting that data. And sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't work when you get to a regulatory endpoint. And actually, we were successful with Spinraza uh, in including a lot of our real world data in our European label, which I thought was such a huge milestone for our teams and our, uh, the regulator colleagues altogether. Because it, I think data sources need to be respected. Mm -hmm. And I think there's ways in which we can really, um, you know, leverage data sources because all our patients who are on these drugs are in so many other settings. And how do we kind of maximize that to think of, you talked about other indications. How do we think about that? Uh, why does it always have to be a de novo trial? Can it yeah. be supplemented? So I think there's many ways in which, but I think the word that was used was creativity. And I think I would say, creativity and flexibility in the ecosystem and then reform, you know, really yeah. thinking about it together, just, just like we are today. Thank you. Thanks again, Priya. Dr. Pellegrini, you have a question. No, I mean, I was just, a, it was just a comment on the previous, uh, on the previous part. And I, I would like to highlight uh, as was done in, in a different way from other people, that how important is the academic research as a basis just to reach the patient, just to expand the technology as, I mean, the, the a solid, very strong basic science at the beginning and in the course of progressing, give the control 
for, of our technology, allow us to have the full control even of very complex technologies. And to, in my case, it was absolutely clear because, I mean, rebuilding the tissue from different patients from different countries, I mean, make a lot of challenge and diversity between individuals. I mean, having a strong basis with the basic research, having a strong connection with academia means to have the possibility to have control of technology. It means to be reproducible. So giving a real hope to the, to the patient, because at that point, I mean, the, the scaling up become controllable. We can, we can manage it because we know which are the variable, how can be controlled, and we can give a real hope. In addition, this increased the knowledge, hoping from one discovery, the possibility to enlarge to many other discoveries. Of course, this is a strong collaborative effort and should start from the beginning. As I have to say, the interaction between academia and uh, entrepreneurs is not an easy job. <laughs> I think it's very difficult. I have to say that, the, that probably uh, the beginning is very simple, is based on the language. We have different language, different terms, different um, way to express our priorities. But in, in, if we are able to overcome this problem through um, education from the university, from the beginning uh, of uh, all the new future scientists uh, to regulatory issues, uh, to the long-term perspective, long-term view of what is coming after the research, this will uh, provide an education that will form a new category of, of uh, professionals that will be more, uh, let's say, more suitable for the interaction and make this kind of interaction more easy. This is critical to reduce the value of death, which is something that occurs in standard drug, in biological drugs, in advanced therapy, medicinal products, everywhere. So start from the language because humans connect each other by the language and mean different environment, have a different language and different priority. If we are able to, to teach from the beginning of the study to the students how to interact, how to explain, how to uh, consider even the, the reason of other people, this creates a path to work in. And, and secondly, I mean, again, the science because gives uh, the control and as was written somewhere, the power is nothing without control. We need a high percentage of results to be convincing to find entrepreneurs. If you have a high, high rate of success, of course, the people will be more, um, I mean, more happy to, to invest in this kind of therapy. If we have something highly variable because we cannot control the, the, the system, we are not convincing anybody. So I think this is a critical point. Thank you. Great point. Thank you. And I think you know the, the, the investment industry and those that play a great bridge between academic, academic science and, and those of us who work in the industry play a huge role. Uh, as do those technology companies, those sort of unsung heroes in my, from my perspective, those companies that are out there who actually help us collect the data, to organize it, to become better at it, really play a huge role in terms of making the science possible. Sort of, you know, Greg, you had a question or a comment? Uh, you know, just a, a one quick comment. You know, from the standpoint of um, healthcare inequities and and you know broader representation in clinical trials, there really needs to be a societal demand for that. And it's fantastic to see over the last few years how that's built. Because uh, you know, again, there are um, you know it's challenging to reach broader populations of patients, but it's nice to see things like post marketing requirements and again organizations coming together to do that. On the you know how do we get our drugs more broadly around the world? We need to be laser like focused on the value of our medicines, which means probably not for the indications we're talking about since these are orphan diseases, but particularly for the larger diseases, using biology to subset those, you know, whether it's in leukemia, looking at minimal residual disease, or it, cancer is easy to talk about. So, or in lung cancer, it's many diseases and figuring out which molecular um, subset you're looking at. We are going to be able to use these tools in inflammation uh, and in cardiovascular to pick out the patients. You know, it won't just be someone who has had a heart attack. It will be, you know, certain genetic signatures, certain biologic, um, you know, fingerprints that we're going to define the disease populations. And I think that will crank up the value of therapies 
for countries around the world. And hopefully that will mean that, again, we can reach broader populations. Thanks again, Greg. And at this point, I'd like to open up the poll for the audience in terms of let's hear from the audience. You know, you've heard some very inspiring stories. We've all heard some great stories today in terms of how these drugs came to be and how they're impacting patients. We'd love to get your thoughts in terms of, and the nominees are, so, Etcetris from Takeda, Holocar from Holostem, Kaladeco from, from Vertex, Kimria from Novartis, Enplate from Amgen, Spindraza from Ionis and Biogen, and Yaskarta from Gilead. So with that, we have the poll open. 10 seconds more. Those of you who are still thinking, now's your chance. Okay, great. And I'm now gonna close the poll. We've got great participation. Thank you. Can you see the results or? I'm not able to see the screen for a second. Great, okay. We can see the results. And um, we have Spinraza from Ion Ionis and Biogen leading the charge here with, uh, with, with a significant percentage of the votes. That's fantastic. And you can see sort of, you know, in my opinion, every patient, like, like a couple of our colleagues pointed out, is a winner. Every rare disease patient who has benefited from this is a winner. Every patient is a winner. I mean, if you think of the story of what actually happened with immunotherapies in general, the whole CAR-T space in immuno-oncology, it's really changed the face of cancer. We've, I didn't think, you know, reading a book, The Emperor of All Maladies, going back a few, a couple of decades ago, thinking about cancer as what it was, as something that we were all, we've been dealing with it for millennia, and all of a sudden, and certainly in my lifetime, to see a massive difference happen is something that I certainly couldn't have imagined. I think that's really what the promise of what we in this industry can bring, bring uh, to us is. I, I'm, I'm aware of the passage of time. I just want to sort of perhaps open the um, conversation back up to our panel for any additional thoughts that you might have, uh, any guidance to us uh, collectively as an industry in terms of what we might do on behalf of our patients and a call to arms in terms of keeping this pace going in terms of what we have a long way to go in terms of solving unmet, unmet need. Feel free to jump in, anyone. I, I, I would just comment that I think we're at a, you know, a transition point. I, I say that every decade, but uh, I, I truly believe that technology and the creativity of, of uh, humans is creating vast opportunities for medicines that are gonna have a big impact on a number of different patients throughout the world. And you know, I would just encourage us not to, uh, to keep that going. And uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's you know, a very nice point in, in my career to kind of see where we are from a technology and, and really nothing's out, out of reach today. And uh, uh, we just have to focus on it and, and get it done as an industry. But uh, I, I'm very pleased where, where, where we are today, you know, from a technology perspective. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Frank. We are at time, and I want to sort of thank our organizers. I want to thank the Gallian Foundation and Pregallian for setting this up and really getting, this, getting us the platform that, that I think we so richly deserve, and I mean, our patients so richly deserve. I look forward to seeing all of you in New York City on the 27th uh, for the award ceremony. And with that, I'd like to thank each of our panelists I really would like to thank you, from, you know, sincerely to you and your teams and your companies for doing what you do on behalf of patients. It makes a gigantic difference, and this is what we all come to work to do every day. And again, thanks so much for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.